Hey guys, it's Wilker Patrick, nursing educator in Psych Corsetta, and today we're going to go over vital signs assessment for your fundamentals in nursing class. What do you need to know? Vital signs assessment is typically one of your first lab skill checkoffs, so that way they can understand that you know how to take vital signs. And also, same thing in your lectures, you're going to be tested on this on your nursing exams and your fundamentals in nursing class. So you need to understand those key concepts for vital signs. So let's get right into it. First, we want to go over what is actually checked with vital signs. So we have TPR, blood pressure and SpO2. And then, of course, pain now is kind of considered a vital sign. It's your sixth vital sign. But all in all, that we have five vital signs that are evaluated objectively. So we have your temperature. So TPR means temperature, pulse, respirations, BP, blood pressure. SpO2 is your pulse oximetry. We're going to go over each one of these in detail. So temperature, what do you need to know about temperature? So temperature, of course, what is it really used for? Well, temperature is usually one of our first signs of an infection. So a fever, which by the way, a fever is defined by a temperature of 100.4 or greater. Normal temperature ranges from 97.6 to 99.6, which may vary depending on what textbook you guys are using in your nursing school. Now let's go over those measurement sites. So number one, oral. This is usually our most preferred because it is one of our most accurate, but our most accurate is of course the rectum, which is not used unless we cannot get a temperature. Now, newer patients, this is much more common where they use the rectal temperature because it's much more difficult to get it and they need a more accurate reading. But the oral temperature in the adult world is what you're going to see. So when taking oral temperature, this is what you need to know. So when you take an oral temperature, you need to make sure that your patient hasn't drank anything that was hot or cold 15 to 30 minutes before you actually take it. Because, of course, if you drink something hot, they could give a false reading that they have a fever. They drink something cold it will maybe not read anything at all. Well, as I said, oral temperature is usually the most preferred, but there are some contraindications such as the patient who had oral surgery or someone who is at high risk for seizures. And then lastly about oral temperatures, you guys are gonna to wanna to write this down because you're most likely gonna be questioned about this, is that when you take an oral temperature, you need to put it in a posterior sublingual pocket. So just to put it simple is when you have a thermometer, you wanna place the thermometer underneath the tongue in the very back in that sublingual pocket. So it goes underneath the tongue and the patient must close their mouth and seal it. Since we already mentioned it, let's go over rectal temperatures. So rectal temperatures, once again, are used as a last resort type of thing for adults, more commonly used for pediatrics. But if you cannot get a temperature on a patient, or if you're needing something that's extremely accurate, then you need to do a rectal temperature. Now, first of all, when you're taking a rectal temperature, you need to make sure it's the right probe. So oral temperature probes are typically blue, and then you got your rectal temperature probes that are typically red. So please make sure you check that and make sure you're checking with your hospital policy, depending on where you're at with clinical. What do you need to know about taking a rectal temperature? Number one, positioning. Place them in the lateral SIMS position on their left side. You wanna apply lubrication and insert 1.5 inches into the rectum and allow the temperature probe to gather the temperature reading. So what are the nursing considerations slash contraindications for taking a rectal temperature? Well, typically a cardiac patient is contraindicated for a rectal temperature because when you insert a rectal probe, it may cause something called a vagal response, which rapidly decreases the heart rate. So if you have a cardiac patient, you want to be sure that it is okay to put a rectal probe in with your physician per the order. And of course, things such as, you know, rectal surgeries, are they're at risk for bleeding or they already have a GI bleed? It may be already contraindicated to do a rectal temperature. Your next temperature measurement site would be the axilla. So the axilla is used if the oral or the rectal is contraindicated and you just need to get a temperature. This is not very accurate reading, but it is used if those are contraindicated. And then nowadays, they also have those temporal or tympanic probes, which are not really used in the hospital setting. Those are usually used out in the outpatient world. But this is not commonly questioned about on your exams or even on your clinical lab skill checkoffs. But when you're taking a temporal temperature, you usually start with the forehead and you go all the way back and you end underneath the earlobe. So that's how you take a temporal. Hey guys, it's Wilker Patrick, nursing educator inside Corsetta. I wanted to let you guys know that I will help you with anything you need at any time if you just send me a text at 940-218-4062, 940-218-4062. Let's get back to the video. All right, so next is pulse. So a normal range of a pulse for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. The most common site to check a pulse is your radial site. So you're checking your radial pulse here. When you're checking that pulse rate, you also want to note the pulse strength, symmetry, and rhythm of that pulse. I'll write this down. You're going to be asked about this. When you're checking a carotid pulse, you never put both your hands checking both the sites at the same time because you could essentially make them pass out. I guarantee it, your nursing instructors are going to question you about that. And also you may see it on your nursing exam in your fundamentals of nursing class. Another thing they might question about is your dorsalis pedis pulse. Now this is one of the most difficult pulses to find. It's on the bottom of your foot. 
Now this is the most distal pulse away from the heart. So if you're checking for any circulation issues down to the lower extremities, this is the pulse you wanna check. This may be a question. If you cannot feel the pulse, you use a Doppler to verify if there is a pulse. Now going over the apical pulse, you're gonna learn how to do an apical pulse. Things you need to know that is you check an apical pulse for one full minute. So you're actually going to be putting your stethoscope or you're going to actually palpate the apical pulse for one full minute and count using a stopwatch. Now you can find the apical impulse at your fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line. Another thing you're gonna to need to know is the pulse deficit. So a pulse deficit is the difference between your apical impulse and your radial impulse. So a pulse deficit is defined by there is more impulses at your apical because that's where your heart is, of course, than there is with your radial. So that's essentially telling you that they may have an issue with circulation throughout the rest of their body is that's a quick little way to find out with a pulse deficit. And lastly, guys, you just need to understand how to grade a pulse. So it goes from plus four to zero. So zero being it's not there at all to plus four, it's very bounding. Next is respiration. So respirations, their normal range for an adult is 12 to 20 respirations per minute. Now remember guys, a respiration is one full breath in. So one inspiration and one full breath out. So one expiration. That cycle is one full respiration. The typical method for measuring respirations is you measure for 30 seconds and you multiply that by two to get your number. And when you're measuring respirations, you wanna measure the rate, the depth, and the pattern of your respirations. Now, some of your instructors might teach you this as the best way to do it. So when you're checking respirations, you usually do that right after you're done measuring the pulse, but you don't leave your hand from the radio impulse. So that way your patient doesn't know that you're actually watching the respiration rate. So that way it's not impacted. Because as you know, if you know that you're being watched and your respirations are being watched, we can control our respiration rate on demand. So we don't want them to know, so that way it doesn't get a false reading. Now, some questions you might get on your nursing exam, you need to know the difference between bradypnea and tachypnea. Bradypnea is a respiration rate below 12. So it's usually indicated from respiratory depression from drugs. So opioids is a common cause. Or they may have had some neurological damage, such as a head injury or a stroke. And of course, your most common with fundamentals of nursing, they're going to apply it with your perioperative nursing exam, is that post-anesthesia is your most common reason for bradypnea, and it's because of the anesthesia medication. And then tachypnea is a respiration rate over 20. So you want to think hypercapnia, which is high CO2 which stimulates our body to breathe faster to expel the acidic CO2. And then of course, hypoxia. So when we have low oxygen in our blood, our respiration rate goes up to intake more oxygen and then increase metabolic demand. So think of it no different than when you exercise. When you exercise, your respiration goes up. And then of course, heart conditions. If your heart is struggling or if it's demanding a lot of oxygen, then your respiration rate is going to go up. All right, so now blood pressure. So we went through our TPR, now we're at blood pressure. So a normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. So make sure you guys know the classifications of a blood pressure. So anything over 120 now is considered pre-hypertension. Of course, what you're going to need to know with your fundamentals of nursing class is, of course, how to measure it and what are the nursing considerations with your reading. So before you even put that cuff on your patient, you need to make sure it's the right size. A cuff too small could give you a false high reading. A cuff too big could give you a false low reading. You would definitely want to write that down as that's probably going to be at least one of your nursing questions. So when you're about to take your patient's blood pressure, you need to have them do a few things for you as well. Number one, they need to sit down with their legs uncrossed. They should remain still with no talking. You also want to ask them if they've smoked within the last 30 minutes or have had a stimulant such as a caffeine drink because that's going to give you a high reading as well. You're also going to want to know some considerations that may elevate your blood pressure or decrease your blood pressure. So anything that can elevate your blood pressure, those factors are, of course, increased age, increased stress, postmenopause for women, and, of course, a high-sodium diet is one of those big factors as well. You guys are going to want to write this down as well because this is a big concept for your blood pressure is that we need to know about orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is just simply when a patient changes a position too fast, their blood pressure drops and their heart rate increases. This is very common with geriatric patients because geriatric patients are dehydrated a lot because they have a deficient thirst mechanism. Now you guys are going to need to know how to take an orthostatic hypotension. There's three positions, lying, sitting, and stand. And you want to check their blood pressure one to three minutes after they do the position change to see if they have orthostatic hypotension. Some common signs and symptoms that you may see with orthostatic hypotension is dizziness and lightheadedness. Now write this down guys, you're going to need to know it. A orthostatic hypotension is defined by a systolic blood pressure that drops by more than 20 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure that drops by more than 10. All right guys, we're on the last one. So SpO2 it is pulse oximetry. A normal range with pulse oximetry is 95 to 100% for a healthy adult. Now, number one concept, guys, if you have a COPD patient, a normal range for them 
is 88 to 92 percent. But what is pulse oximetry? So pulse oximetry measures the concentration of oxygen in your blood. We measure the pulse oximetry by putting a sticker in the hospital setting over their finger and it's measuring it at all times and it will display on your monitor. Some other sites that you may see, of course, the finger is the number one site. If sometimes we have these older patients that have, you know, not very good circulation, so we may do the earlobe or the forehead as other sites that may be used for pulse oximetry. But if you have a healthy adult, the typical rule is if their pulse oximetry is less than 90%, then that is when you contact a healthcare provider. This also may be asked on your nursing exam. Now, another thing that is just kind of like a side tip for you guys is that you really need to make sure and pay attention to the waveform. If the waveform is just all over the place on your monitor, it's most likely not correct. This happens all the time in the hospital setting, so don't freak out because even if their pulse oximetry reading is low, you should get a good waveform. So a good waveform would look like this. Once again, guys, most of the time, even if their pulse oximetry is like 60% even, you're going to see a good waveform with that. So if there's a bad waveform, it's usually an incorrect reading. Hey guys, first of all, thank you so much for watching the video entirely through. It makes our day if we know that nursing school got a little bit easier after watching one of our videos. If you guys like this video, make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel for more, and drop down in the comments for any more ideas that you need help with nursing school. If you want to contact me personally, it's 940 218 4062. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.